all men cheat. All men are liars. Men, or all Korean, they are the same. They are dogs. <laughs> Some other things I've heard include women are liars. Women like money. Women can do anything for money. And an average woman likes to get the man who has the most money. Hello everyone, welcome to another beautiful episode of Face Friday. My name is Lade Owolabi and today we're going to be talking about, as you can already tell from the title, cheating. Cheating in a relationship. Basically, we're going to be dealing with cheating in marriage. Just like I like to do for Face Fridays, I like to define the terms. Um, and so when we say cheating, what do we mean by cheating or to cheat? It means to act dishonestly. Or unfairly in order to gain an advantage this honestly or unfairly in order to gain advantage so that means first of all when somebody engages in the act of cheating is not being honest they do it intentionally um, to gain an advantage and it's unfair so it is a bad thing cheating is a bad thing we've established that is unfair is dishonest and it's not nice all right so in today's episode i'm going to be going over five reasons five different reasons why people might be cheating or why people cheat let's pray heavenly father i thank you for another opportunity to share with your people to talk about things that affect our love our life and our relationships i ask oh god that today you use my lips of clay to speak to your children in the name of jesus more than i can think more than i can imagine more than i can you know even figure out i want you to speak through me in jesus name amen so the first reason is lack of sexual satisfaction and this is in no particular order lack of sexual satisfaction in a relationship or a marriage as we're talking about sex is a vital part of a relationship sex is not a bad thing in and of itself it is just really it could be really really bad when it's done out of order so i like to think of sex as a fire it's a thing of passion it's something very passionate and just as fires can be used to warm up a room when there's cold you know in the winter um, with your fireplace that's the same way a fire can burn down a house that's the same way a wildfire can burn acres and acres of land that cannot be controlled that's what we call wildfires so sex is like a fire if done out of order it could be very very dangerous and so when you're not sexually satisfied in marriage it is important that you let your partner know lovingly you pray about it together and you find out what you can do ways you can come about helping that situation so when you find that you're not sexually satisfied don't think that it's something you can shove aside maybe you don't want to hurt their feelings you rather tell them and hurt their feelings that way and you guys sort it out than for you to start a fire that you cannot control like google told us earlier unmet expectation when they have an expectation for something in marriage um, and our first point is sex when they have an expectation for sex and it's not met then they're driven to look out for something who, that will give them that satisfaction another reason is self-control self-control is a fruit of the spirit okay and god has given us you know the power and the ability to control ourselves and our emotions but lack of self-control is something that really hurts us in marriage i'm reminded of a story when we talk about self-control a story about king david in the bible and the story can be found in second samuel 11 what happened in second samuel was that there was war and so david was king at the time and the battle was ongoing but david was at home for some reason and so one one evening i think the bible records that it was in the spring so springtime is you know my best season in when i lived in the u.s in nigeria is just hamatan dry season and, and rainy season but springtime is when it rains a little bit but the weather is not too harsh like it's not too cold and definitely not hot but it's just you know nice and cozy uh -huh. so it was in the springtime and david was lounging in the palace and then from where he was he saw uriah's wife taking a bath her name was Bathsheba. he saw her taking a bath um wanted to lay with her 
um, one way or another, he got her to lay with him and then she got pregnant. She sent word to David that she had gotten pregnant. And at this time, all of this time, her husband, Uriah, was in battle. And so David sent for Uriah um, and he told him to take a rest and go home. Uriah did not go home. He stayed in the palace with the servants. And when David found out, he asked him, he said, why didn't you go home to eat and drink and lay with your wife? Apparently, maybe David wanted to set it up so that Uriah would still think that, you know, the child would be his because it would be the same time period, you know. So Uriah did not go home. And when, he, when David asked him, he told David, he said, how can I, how can I go home when my people are, when my men are in battle and he's a military man? He was very patriotic. He was committed to devout to his, the, the kingdom at the time. And so David did not press it further. So what happened was that David said he should stay for a few more days and Uriah still did not go home, didn't see his wife. Um, so David said, okay, no problem. So he sent a letter to Jacob. Jacob was the person leading the army at the time. So the content of the letter that David gave Uriah was literally his death note. He gave him a letter to Jacob and that letter was telling Jacob that he should put Uriah at the hottest front of the battle so he could die so essentially david committed murder when the news came to david that uriah had died what did david do he took bathsheba uriah's wife to become his own wife and of course she was already pregnant she gave birth to a son and the boy ended up dying yes he died um before he died david repented he prayed he fasted he was really really sad and the servants didn't want to tell him but david perceived because of the way the servants were whispering after the boy had died that the boy had died so the boy died but what happened after the boy died god really did forgive david and after then david and bathsheba bore a son and his name was solomon but before then god had spoken to the prophet nathan who came to tell david that you have done wrong you killed uriah you took his wife you you know told him what god had told him and also gave him the consequence for the what he had done even though god has forgiven you there's a consequence and that consequence is that the sword will never depart from your house the sword will never depart from your house this story i find it very interesting and it's not just a story it actually happened um but what happened afterwards even after god had you know told him what the consequence or the punishment would be david and bathsheba which is actually evidence to me that god really did forgive them is that they gave birth to solomon and if you don't know anything about solomon solomon is one of the wisest men that have lived on planet earth um even history books have it so it's not just a religious thing solomon was very very wise he was known to be very wise um, and very wealthy so yes that to me was evidence that god really did forgive him but then again the consequence was also evident in david's life when his children were killing themselves and all of that this is what lack of self-control can cause he didn't only cheat he got her pregnant then he married her then god was angry with him then the child died and then a curse came upon his household which is what i want you to keep in mind although god forgave him there was still a consequence so god will forgive you but when you sin there's always still a consequence there's always a consequence for when you commit a sin lack of self-control is another reason why people cheat another reason is unnecessary emotional attachment unnecessary unnecessary i repeat unnecessary emotional attachment and this is really speaking to my sisters who are like newlyweds and you know you just got married or maybe you've been married for a long time and you know somebody comes in along the way maybe a business partner a colleague a student a professor a lecturer whatever it is and that person all of a sudden now becomes the friend your friend the secret friend your husband just knows that you guys are acquaintances but then a lot of things start happening where you now have an emotional affair my people an affair is an affair cheating is cheating it does not have to be until they lay together it doesn't have to be until you catch them in the act cheating is cheating so when somebody is having an emotional affair is as good as cheating what are the signs and symptoms and i and i put some things down so i'm going to be looking at my book how do you know that you're in an emotional affair there is a test that you can do to find out but let's talk about the symptoms first when you begin to withdraw from your spouse 
um, when you daydream about this friend and when some things happen in the day during your day and you're just thinking what would this person say how would this person react to it um, those are symptoms when intimacy between you and your spouse is reduced or non-existent because of this person when you spend less time together with your spouse when you are confronted with the matter maybe by your spouse or somebody close to you you give the excuse of we're just friends you know that those are symptoms when you look forward to talking to this person you look forward to seeing this person you take extra time to get your clothes ready when you're going out and you know that you'll meet this person you take extra time to get your makeup done you even put on lashes because you're seeing this person those are symptoms of emotional attachment um when you cherish and value alone time with this person um, when you begin to share your thoughts your feelings your problems with this person rather than sharing it with your spouse because your spouse really should be the closest person to you but when you start sharing it with somebody else who is the friend there is an emotional affair going on um when you find different reasons to give this person a special gift maybe you are cooking and maybe you you just you know you make really nice homemade shawarma shawarma is um, a flatbread wrap that we eat in nigeria if you don't know what it is and you know you make shawarma and you take it out to this person maybe your spouse doesn't know you're just like a colleague of mine wants it to the office so i want to take an extra one you know you are finding excuses to give this person gifts um and this person this just friend person seems to understand you better than your spouse you seem to be able to relate better to that person than your spouse um, and then most importantly when you're keeping this friendship a secret okay you're having an emotional affair and an affair is an affair cheating is cheating if you're still not sure from these symptoms that you might be in an emotional affair there's a test you can do i'll tell you a couple of questions and what you can do is see if you answer yes to any three of them and if you do then you're in an emotional affair are you sexually attracted to your friend do you look forward to seeing this your friend do you take extra effort and extra time when you are preparing to meet up with this friend have you compared your spouse with this friend do you share your thoughts your emotions your feelings and the things that happen to you good or bad with your friend first if you've answered yes to three of any of these questions then you are in an emotional affair and you really really need to do something about it what do you need to do you cut it off Every relationship has its bloodline. I like to call it a bloodline for a relationship. And the blood of a relationship is communication. Just like blood is to our body, communication is when it comes to relationships. The day that there's no more blood or something happens to your heart or something happens to your blood, you're gone, you're dead. Um, because that's what keeps you running as a machine, as a system. So in relationships, communication is what keeps you running. And just in case, just in case you're in an emotional affair, cut that relationship, cut that communication. And that is, that is the remedy. That is the cure. That is, and you also now need to, all of these things, you now have to start doing them with your spouse again, making sure you establish that connection emotionally, being intimate with them, sharing your feelings, your emotions, things that happen, you know, good or bad with your spouse first. That's how you can repair when you are in an emotional affair. Another thing that can cause people to cheat is fighting, 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 disagreement, arguments can cause it one thing i would advise couples is that there will be issues when the issues come you have to be armed and how do you get armed by you know listening to stuff like this videos like this getting equipped reading books just developing your mind so that when these issues come you already have what it takes to deal with it you already have the resources to deal with it you already have an arsenal of armory that you can use to attack it that's what you need to do so fighting 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 if fighting happens constantly you need to be able to sit down with your spouse and figure out why are we fighting why are we fighting because at the end of the day you guys are a team you're not on opposing teams you are a team you are a team and i i, I just want to speak that to somebody you are a team 
you people went to the altar you said your vows and you are married you know sometimes fights can get so bad in a marriage you don't even want to see the person you avoid the person you don't want to talk to the person when it comes to the children like you guys are cool you know you give the person their food and all of that but when it comes to just you two you're disconnected you really need to sit down and you need to know that this person actually cares about you and they love you sit down and find out what the reason is and if the person is not budging or is not working out then reach out to a counselor reach out to a third party to intervene before you reach out to a third party try and see if you can solve it between the two of you and move on to the last but definitely not the least bad influence bad influence keeping you know bad company you are only as good as the company you keep your friends when you start doing uh, your back all is kegbe kegbe when you start moving with the wrong crowd you know then you can get influenced if you start hanging around maybe you're a business woman and you start hanging around other business women who say oh um this person doesn't want to give the contract oh you know what to do just meet up with him in the hotel room and you know by your standards that that is not what to, the right thing to do and you're now influenced because it seems like everybody who seems to be successful in this business have done this to be successful my dear sister i'm telling you categorically that that is a big lie of the devil from hell you don't have to be immoral you don't have to cheat you don't have to lie to be successful god is the giver of success and if you are on the good side you can still be successful and god calls it good success good success is able to give you good success the type of riches that come without sorrow what's the point of getting a contract if after you get the contract you're treating high blood pressure because your conscience is judging you and you know what you've done you're using all the money you're making to treat health issues or to cover up your lies and cover up your secrets and people who will start blackmailing you there's no point the kind of riches that god plans to give you is the one that comes without any sorrow without any sorrow and it's possible to get it so please i hope this encourages you um these are the reasons i have come up with as to why as to why people cheat um before i wrap up the episode i just want to talk a bit about the consequence what happens when people cheat some people have told me in a case of cheating lady i can't forgive him I can't stand looking at him anymore. Every time I see him, that's all I think about. How he chose her over me. Like, what's in her? Cheating is very, very difficult to forgive. What is possible to forgive? And I'm going to refer you guys to a video PJ and I did about forgiveness. And I'll put the link up. I'll also put the link in the description below about forgiveness. Forgiveness. Where does forgiveness come in if we feel like we can't get over our spouse cheating on us? Um, I know for men, because men are kind of possessive. So in the case of a man where the wife is the one cheating, they can't even, they can't, it's like zero tolerance. I guess it's also cultural because I guess women are taught in the Yoruba culture. I said it at the beginning of this video. They are taught that all men are cheats, all men are lies, all men are dogs. Um, but that's not that's not the case, and that's not what God wants. God wants you to be happy. And if your spouse is cheating and you think it's normal, it is not normal. Something should be done about it because sooner or later, um, twenty five years down the line, thirty years down the line, you just find out that people are getting divorced. Why? Because the only thing that has kept them together is the children and when the children start getting married and they leave the house there's nothing keeping them together again because they've just been roommates and not husband and wife like i say in a lot of my videos if there's any physical abuse in the matter physical abuse or mental or emotional where you are feeling like you are sleeping out of your mind like your mind is telling you you know strangle him or your mind is telling you kill him or your mind is telling you poison his food and you're going in and out of consciousness you know you know that this is unhealthy and this is not safe leave we do advise separation because first of all you need to be alive and it's not just physical abuse that can kill you um mental abuse can also kill you because you can kill him kill yourself kill everybody emotional abuse can also kill they're all equally dangerous so my first advice when i counsel anybody who's going through a, a form of abuse if you can leave you need to leave i said healing takes time so you need to heal first and then both of you review the situation um and then if he repents if he truly repents then you can consider it the same applies to men as well if your wife is the one who has cheated or who is abusing you emotionally or physically or mentally so but what does the bible say about 
adultery because fornication is when you're single and you're just doing kakiri everybody everything is cut you just keep doing it which is still wrong by the way even when you're single fornication is still a sin and it's wrong when you're married that's adultery what happens what does the bible recommend to be the punishment of someone who's adulterous let's read from john chapter 8 to get a context of what god thinks about adultery um, starting from verse 8, he said, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act now moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned but what do you say this they said testing him <laughs> so they were testing him like maybe you said you are a teacher eh the pharisees and the religious people the very very smart people who knew the law they said moses told us that we should stone such person to death so what do you say this they said testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him of but jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear them because i'm sure he must have sensed in the spirit that this was a test so when they continued asking him he raised himself up and said to them he who is without sin among you let him throw a stone at her first and again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. When I first read this scripture while I was preparing for this video, I got emotional. And this is why. I got emotional after Jesus, you know, rose up and he, he saw that, it was just the woman left and he asked her he said where are your accusers has no one condemned you and she said no one lord but then jesus said to her neither do i condemn you go and sin no more this is the word of god to somebody listening to me now if you are repentant if you would go and sin no more jesus does not condemn you hallelujah and because jesus doesn't condemn you you too should not condemn other people he asked them he said who is without sin should throw the first stone is there one of us that can say truly that we are without sin there is no way if you search your heart there is no way you can come out and say so even the scribes and the pharisees and those people couldn't come out and say i am without sin all those people left and jesus told her go and sin no more this is my word to you if you are in an affair go and sin no more and if you're accusing somebody can you throw the stone Jesus does not condemn anyone. We shouldn't either. He loves all of us. He loves us with an unending love. And he has told us that the life that he has given us is the life of light. The life of light. And if you really love God, God is not a mumu. God is not a fool. The fact that he forgives you every time you sin doesn't mean that you should continue sinning. Because truly, if you understand the love of God, the love of God compels you to live right. The love of God compels you to walk right. The love of God compels you to live in the way of the Lord. That's why we're Christians. To be a Christian is not a religion. Being a Christian is to be like Christ. Christ doesn't condemn. Christ loves this is all i have on today's episode of faith friday i hope it has blessed you it surely has blessed me if you're trying to reach me if there's something you want to discuss with me my email will be on the screen and i'll be happy to hear from you if this video has blessed you please be sure to share on your social media i will be happy to repost and reshare wherever you share it on if you tag me my name is ladeo olavi on all platforms so i'll be happy to hear from you guys thank you so much again for watching until next time don't forget to be the best version of you. Bye.